Hello, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we are doing another bayonet demo. Talking about the model 1886 AP bayonet, widely known as the Rosalie. This is a, uh, a, a bayonet that the French were very fond of. They kept it in service forever. Um, officially, it was originally issued with the model 1886 label in the pattern seen on the top here. This is a early first pattern version of the bayonet. We'll be talking about the differences and a lot of this video will be shot uh, in a tabletop format, but we're going to go over the general history and changes here. So these early ones are a total of, and I'm going to the nearest eighth of an inch here, but the 25 and an eighth inches long overall 20 and a half inch long spike. This is a cruciform spike bayonet. These early variations again are super long to the point that it's absurd. Uh, they actually wound up cutting them down pretty substantially. You see that on both of these examples here. And again, they're long to the point there was actually a problem. Uh, they tend to bend or break if hit on almost anything and they're long enough that they tended to get hit on a lot of stuff. Also, these early ones you'll see have a hooked quillion, and this, uh, they call this a German silver handle here, but it is actually a nickel alloy. And on this early pattern, you'll also see the base of it is just this simple round dot. Now, for comparison, we'll bring out uh, the brass handle example. You can see the difference in the bottom there. What that is, so these early ones are basically no tang. It is simply screwed into a piece inside the handle here that ends on that spot. And you can, again, see the difference here. These ones with this base are full tang. From my understanding, you can find examples with the German silver handle. Uh, both without the quillion and with the second variation of attachment point, the full tang. Other major differences uh, are a little more minute, so we'll be taking a look at that when we go to the tabletop. But they're really, we've got the three uh, major patterns represented here, but uh, there, there are sub variations of all of these and any combination of features seen on these three bayonets is fairly common. We did talk a bit about these bayonets when we did the Berthier Model 1907-15 video. Uh, this is kind of meant more as a standalone uh, to just uh, talk about the bayonet itself, especially since my friends at the Warfront were kind enough to loan me, actually, this brass handle example you see here. This is a German cut-down example. The Germans kept these in use during their occupation of France, and Again, the original is absurdly long. Both the German cutdown and French cutdown, this is a uh, post-World War I cutdown example with the iron handle, which is a little more rare, are cut down to 18 and an eighth inches overall, 13 and a half inch blade. So they cut fully seven inches off of the blade and it's still, you know, fairly long. But they were, uh, again, issued with the Lebel rifle and uh, both the primary patterns of the Berthier that were used in World War One, the 1907-15 and Modifi 1916, respectively. Long rifles, specifically. They had a very different pattern of bayonet for the carbines of the, uh, the Berthier rifle. But they really liked the cruciform spikes. They actually uh, stuck with a similar design all the way through the, uh, the Moss 36 we've got right over here. Still kept that cruciform spike, and it is just a little shorter than the cut-down epi bayonet. The Germans had their own nickname for these. They called them French knitting needles. And, yeah, they, they served from the 1880s all the way through World War II in one pattern or another. Again, we've got an early pattern here, and then for the French, this would be a very late pattern as it is again the iron handle and you can definitely feel a pretty substantial weight difference this iron handle one is the heaviest one but when the french cut them down they blued the blade 
the Germans, when they cut them down, did not. But it is almost exactly identical in length. I do have an example of a scabbard for this cut down example. And from my understanding, this is a confirmed bring back. Um, I'd have to ask Drew or Lawrence at the war front, but they, they had the whole story on who brought this back and under what circumstances. But you can see this is actually a Car 98 frog that has been kind of forced onto an EP scabbard. This right here actually would be the original EP scabbard. As you can see, it has the same attachment point. And when they did this modification, when they cut these down, they didn't make a new scabbard for them. They simply cut the scabbard itself and then uh, reworked the end of it. So you see they've got a kind of different style of nose on the both of these. Generally speaking, when it comes to the material that the handles are made of, it uh, would just go straight German silver, nickel alloy, to brass, to iron. Again, not a lot of the iron example were made. And this is a, again, French cut down. They did this in the 30s. They uh, they revamped pretty much their whole arsenal in the 30s, uh, just before the adoption of the Moss 36. All Labelle and Berthier rifles were revamped for uh, ball and ammo, and around that same time, modifications were made to the bayonet. The other major difference, again, we'll look at this closer when we go to the tabletop, but it is actually the latch. Uh, the length of travel of the latch was extended dramatically from the earliest pattern to the later patterns, and even the manner in which the latch itself looks is a little bit different. But yeah, um, if you're new to the channel, you probably are wondering, like, this guy keeps on talking about the war front. So, again, this uh, example here, we actually are borrowing from them. I'll be bringing it back to them after the shooting of this video. But uh, about half or more than half of my entire military surplus collection is from the war front. So, I definitely am fond of the store, and both Lawrence and Drew, the owners, are good dudes. And also Marie, who owns the Seattle location, but they're located in uh, Portland, Oregon. Technically, I guess they'd be in Gladstone, but Portland, Oregon is what it says on their website. They do have a website. You can find them pretty easily. They sell all manner of military surplus equipment, primarily First and Second World War, but uniforms, guns, bayonets, knives... Whatever. Uh, most of my fighting knives are from them, actually, or at least half of them are. But yeah, I think uh, that'll about cover what we're uh, what we're gonna do here in this segment. So let's go ahead and transition to the tabletop and take a closer look at some of the little differences between these guys. So there's the full lineup of them. We actually went over pretty much all of the details. Uh, with the exception of taking a closer look at what I'd mentioned about the locking latch. Um, and even that, like I say, we actually briefly mentioned it. So on the earliest example, and we'll be looking closely at this, you see the shape of the locking latch, and it only travels a very small difference. If you watch right by the screw here, you can see its total length of travel. It's very shallow. Uh, you can also see from the back here, that is all that you're locking in with. And it really isn't much. And these early examples had a tendency to slip off the gun. Now, by comparison, if you take, again, close look at the length of the locking piece itself. And as far as length of travel, I would just use my iron piece as an example, but as you can see, the whole thing being a uniform color actually makes it a little harder to show up on camera. So, looking at it from this angle, probably be the best way to see the full effect. It is about twice the length of travel on the later examples. Serial numbers on these, on the early ones, it's found on the, uh, I always have a hard time knowing for sure if it said Quillen or Quillian, but on the hook, that is where your serial number would be on the early examples. On later examples, the serial number is on the flat where the hook would have been. 
as seen on both the brass and iron handled examples. And that really pretty much covers it. Um, they fit inside their scabbard from either direction. It's not really something that you have to pay all that much attention to when putting them in. Uh, you can actually see on this early scabbard example, it is slightly bent and the blade does fit in without seeming to torque itself too much. Uh, this blade could use a little bit of a cleaning, but uh, th this particular example I don't think ever had to be straightened, or if it did, it was pretty minor, because usually if you find a, a spot where that's really dark, that often indicates that it was heated and bent at that point. And then, well, just to show with the German cut-down example, same thing, it really doesn't matter what direction you come into the scabbard from with this particular style of bayonet. And yeah, that about covers it, really. I, again, want to shout out my friends at the Warfront and say thank you for loaning me this brass-handled German cut-down example. These other two are mine. And if you stuck around to this point, got a couple of announcements before I let you guys go. We are in December, so final month of the year. The year-end wrap-up video will be coming up on uh, January 1st or 2nd. I'll be doing the uh, 2023 introductory video slash 2022 wrap-up video. Got some good stuff coming between now and then. Got an individual demo that... I'm hoping to have done by then a full-length demo on the Radom Viz 35. Also got a couple of part twos. I think the Smith & Wesson Model 1917 and the Mosin Nagant 9130. Part two demos will be something that I think we're going to be pushing forward with going forward. And, you know, uh, making more of them as they've actually gotten a, uh, a fairly surprising amount of, uh, of traction. Uh, at least, you know, surprising to me. I I did have it suggested that I do those part two videos by a subscriber. And uh, I don't remember who the subscriber was off the top of my head. But if you know that it was you, thank you, sir. Because, uh, like I say, those videos seem to have actually garnered some attention. So i got a couple of those coming up. And something that I'm working on that could be really cool maybe for the final video of 2022 a machine gun shooting supercut that could be uh, a lot of fun as well as a number of shorts scattered throughout so got a good amount of content coming to you in December all of that I'm planning on having done in December and then going into the new year well at least one of those two uh, part twos will be December one of them may carry over to January but we'll see it's pretty likely that it'll all get posted in December I'm trying to uh beef up my numbers as much as possible. We're getting really close to 3,000 subscribers on the channel, which is huge to me. So, had a couple of, uh, the last two months have been the biggest months for channel growth so far. So, if December ranks in the top three, we'll break 3,000 before the new year, of which would, uh, again, to me, just be really cool. So, I don't usually uh, go on a like, share, and subscribe rant at the end of my videos, but in this particular one, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Please like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, comment. Uh, all of these things help the channel be noticed in the YouTube algorithm, and it helps with channel growth. It seems to me that a good half or more of my subscribers seem to find me just simply via word of mouth, but the shorts have definitely contributed to growth enormously, so I will be posting a lot more shorts. Oh, I think I've got five shot right now, and when next time I go to the range to shoot machine guns, I'm planning on, uh, if I shoot anything new, getting a couple more of those out. And they do have a few guns that I haven't got to shoot yet. So we'll see how that pans out. Meanwhile, I hope you all enjoyed the video. It's been Thomas with Great Northwest Weaponry. We'll see you guys next time.